Hi, I'm Old North Specialist Dr. Jackson Crawford. In this video, what I'd like to do is walk you through some of the steps you can take and resources you can seek if you're getting serious about the study of either the Old Norse language or the literature written in the Old Norse language, particularly if you don't have access to a teacher or a degree program in these studies. Now, I don't know why, I don't pretend to know why, uh, you would have an interest in getting deep into the study of these subjects, but then who knows why I did, I suppose. Uh, I will say that since it is no longer my job, since I no longer teach at a university, to uh, encourage people to give universities money, I would not encourage you to go and seek out graduate education in a field like this unless you have access to either independent wealth or the ability to make your own living outside of the university system. It's uh, not a great job market, and even for those of us who uh, have been lucky enough to have some jobs within that system, those jobs are never permanent and involve moving around a lot, a lot of uncertainty, a lot of precarity, and a lot of social stigma inside and outside the ivory tower that comes with being a uh, you know low-level PhD instructor. Uh, I don't encourage anybody to take that group out. Um, so I guess that's actually part of why I try to put up some of the resources that I do about how to learn about this stuff without you having to pay somebody tuition. And of course when you pay somebody tuition the person who's getting that money isn't the person teaching you in the classroom anyway. So, to begin with, let's talk about language. The Old Norse language is difficult. I don't think there's any way around that. Um, while it is closely related to English, it is closely related to an older kind of English that was a lot more grammatically complicated from the perspective of a speaker of our present day language, or even the perspective of a speaker of present day Norwegian or Swedish or Danish. It's not an easy language to self-study and the only quality book that I'm aware of that uh, seeks to kind of be a self-study manual, although it's still really more of a classroom manual, is A New Introduction to Old Norse, uh, which is principally by Michael Barnes with Anthony Falks. This series is uh, available for free as I speak. It has been for several years. Uh, on the PDF library at the Viking Society for Northern Research. That sounds like a made-up group, but it's actually a uh, scholarly group that publishes a lot of books uh, in this field. And uh, you can download the introduction, the grammar, the reader, and the glossary as uh, four different PDF files. Now, if you have already done the heavy lifting of learning an inflectional languages grammar before, that is, if you already are uh, very academically familiar with Latin, Greek, um, or a modern language like Russian or German, which has a fair amount of inflection still, you might benefit perhaps more from studying with E.V. Gordon's Introduction to Old Norse. This is such an old book that it credits J.R.R. Tolkien in the acknowledgments as a random guy teaching Old English and Old Norse at Oxford and, you know, nothing to do with Hobbit or Lord of the Rings. Um, it's a very old-fashioned book, definitely presumes, re really, it basically presumes, you know, Latin, uh, and probably German and French. Um, but if you do know Latin or a similar inflectional language that works like that, um, it can be a really good manual and a good way to, uh, well, make yourself learn all of the paradigms and grammar. Um, I learned from Gordon myself, but keep in mind that when I did, I had already studied Latin and Old English quite seriously. If you're wondering why uh, I would say that it's such a big deal to learn the grammar, people who haven't encountered an inflectional languages grammar before don't understand all that can be 
communicated in the word grammar. They think grammar is like word order and, uh, you know, whether it's you and I or you and me. Um, however, in a language like Old Norse, it's really the difference between whether the word for uh, son, like my daughter and my son, is sonar or son or sonar or sunim, whether the word for take is tek or tekr or tokum, takid or taka. And uh, these are not uh, particularly intuitive differences for a speaker of uh, present day English or even a present day continental Scandinavian language. Now, if you have started to work on some Old Norse, um, I would say, even if you're very interested in runes, save runes for a good bit later. It's not something that you need to learn right away, and you'll understand runes a lot better if you already know the languages being written in them better. Remember, uh, especially for any of you watching this who are very new to this stuff, runes are not their own language. They are an alphabet for writing a language. And the uh, runic alphabets are designed to write particular languages, Elder Futhark for a stage of the language earlier than Old Norse, that we can call Proto-Norse or even Proto-Germanic, and uh, the 16-letter Younger Futhark for Old Norse itself. And the rules for writing the language depend on some of a native speaker's intuition, or at least a competent speaker's intuition. And you're not going to have that if you come at it, you know, trying to learn runes right away. It's also worth noting that nothing very interesting is written in runes. That's an exaggeration because there's some really uh, excitingly mysterious and even quite long inscriptions like the Rook Rune Stone, which I looked at in a recent video. Uh, in person with Professor Henrik Williams. Um, but the bulk of the cool stuff that's written in Old Norse is written in the Roman alphabet, right? The very same alphabet as we use today with the addition of a few extra letters. Um, all the sagas, the Eddas, etc. are written in the Roman alphabet. So put runes off till later. And by the way, I would tell you that um, if you find a uh, a book that purports to introduce you to Old Norse that starts real early off with runes that uh, you kind of have that author's number already because there's really no reason to do that. Um, it's completely misleading as the nature of reading this language and to me speaks to perhaps uh, less familiarity with the language than the author might pretend to. Or perhaps just very cynical commercial motives. Now if you are really serious about getting into the scholastic study of this stuff, uh, learning Old Norse is not going to be quite enough. You're going to need to be able to read the modern Scandinavian languages because so much of the scholarship in the last couple hundred years about Old Norse language and literature and mythology is in the Scandinavian languages. If you have to uh, choose one at my recommendation between Norwegian, Swedish, and Danish. Uh, I've bounced around about this, but I think that uh, if I just had to recommend one, I would say Swedish, and here's the reason. One is that if you are interested in runes, a huge proportion of the scholarship on runes is going to be in Swedish, so you're going to have access to scholarship that you wouldn't have access to otherwise. Another is that if you can read one of those three languages, Norwegian, Swedish, Danish, you can read the other three. And so while the choice between them might be sort of random in principle, there are more resources for learning Swedish than there are for learning Norwegian or Danish. And that's just because of the numbers, right? There's more than twice as many speakers of uh, Swedish than there are of Norwegian or Danish, and maybe of Norwegian and Danish if you count all the second language speakers in Finland. So there's just more stuff out there. Uh, I recommend, if you are interested in learning Swedish, uh, there's a good self-study book and audio set called Colloquial Swedish by uh, Holmes, uh, Savendary, and Serin. Uh, it's pretty easy to find. Likewise, while modern Swedish and modern Norwegian and Danish are uh, big languages of scholarship and Old Norse studies, so is modern Icelandic. 
It's often exaggerated how much Old Norse and Modern Icelandic are alike one another. You really do need to study Icelandic as its own thing, particularly if you mean to ever do any kind of real communication in Iceland. Um, and uh, happily, there is a good uh, similar book and audio set called Colloquial Icelandic by Daisy uh, Neyman, which you can easily find as well if you're interested in learning Icelandic. If you want to learn other languages uh, that are useful in this connection, um, it's very helpful to know how to read German, particularly for older scholarship, which is often in German. Uh, for example, the only grammar of Old East Norse, which, side note, I don't understand who made such a big deal in popular culture about the Old East Norse versus Old West Norse distinction. I have a weird feeling that it might have been something Neil Gaiman got off about at one point. But people really obsess about this. There is no textbook for learning Old East Norse as distinct from Old West Norse. If you learn to read Old Norse, you're learning Old Icelandic. And as a reason for that, it's because all the literature is in Old Icelandic. If you want to learn more about Old East Norse, which is to say another dialect of Old Norse that is more directly ancestral to Swedish and Danish, you can do that, but you need the background in Old West Norse or Old Icelandic to do that, because that's just where all the materials are. Right, I mean, and I, I'm trying to think of an analogy with a modern language, but it's like, until pretty recently, there were probably not a lot of classes in Catalan. You would probably learn Spanish and then maybe study Catalan if you went to Barcelona or something, right? Similar deal. When everything that you can read is in Old Icelandic, aside from a few minor things that are fairly short, um, that's just what all of the texts are going to be about. So don't obsess about the Old East Norse, Old West Norse difference, certainly not early on. Um, you're not, I don't know what it is about how people kind of obsess about this. You're not being like unfaithful to, <laughs> I don't know, Old East Norse if you're studying Old Icelandic first. That's what you have to do. Okay, anyway, I, mentioned, I was talking about learning German. The book that brought all this to mind is that the only grammar of Old East Norse specifically is in German. It's by Adolf Moraine, who also wrote very influential, although outdated, grammar of um, Old West Norse. Uh, and of course, Latin is a big linchpin language if you're doing any kind of medieval literature. Uh, any medieval language is sort of helpful beyond that. Um, Old English. Of course, there's a lot of similarity between Old English and Old Norse. Uh, Old French, there's a surprising amount of translations into Old Norse from Old French. Finnish, uh, there's not enough Old Norse scholars who are competent in Finnish uh, who can work on both the Kalevala and the Edda in the original language, etc. In other words, once you open that Pandora's box of sort of relevant languages, there's really kind of no end to it. But I'll stop there with my top three recommendations if you're getting into this subject. Old Norse modern Icelandic as its own field, and a modern Scandinavian language. If you have no reason to prefer one of the three, I would say Swedish. Come back and talk a little bit more about uh, some other books to check out, some other scholars to follow, literature, uh, after a quick break. Now, I firmly believe that the difference between a real expert with depth of knowledge in a subject and a pedant who knows uh, a lot of random details that aren't very relevant but uh, can make him sound superficially smarter than you because of all the names of things he can drop is that the real expert knows the basics front and back, top to bottom. It is a fact that uh, you're probably a better driver if you are uh, someone who drives a lot rather than someone who, I don't know, goes to the racetrack once every two months but otherwise doesn't really drive a normal car. Uh, it's a little bit of a stupid analogy, but you need to be real familiar with the basics. Um, 
I reread the same books again and again just to make sure that I'm not forgetting basic important facts. Let's start with uh, literature that you ought to be familiar with if you want to be a serious student of Old Norse language, literature, mythology, etc. I would be familiar with the Eddas. Now, to begin with, you might want to read these in translation. Obviously, it takes a while to build up enough proficiency in reading Old Norse. I've translated the Poetic Edda in a style that is meant to uh, be pretty transparent, pretty modern, emphasize the content of the stories rather than try to duplicate any part of the poetic structure of the original. Um, for a student of Old Norse, the most useful book that I've, pub that I've that's been published by me, the most useful book of mine that's been published is uh, The Wanderer's Halvamal, which includes the text of uh, Halvamal, the longest poem in the Poetic Edda, uh, both in the original Old Norse and on a facing page uh, in my English translation, and then has a commentary on some of the difficult parts of the translation. There's also the Prose Edda. The only good translation that's available in English is the one by Anthony Falks. It's titled simply Edda, because he's giving it the same title, Snorri is Sturlis and Dead. You can get into the whole story of what this word means at a, in the title and all that, but that's kind of neither here nor there. I am going to produce my own translation, but that is uh, the next book project, or maybe the third book project, after my current book project, which is actually a new uh, textbook in Old Norse for someone who has never uh, studied the language before and, and doesn't have access to a classroom or teacher. So my Prosetta translation is still a good bit in the future. I would turn to Falks. His translation style is quite a bit different from mine, and uh, he bases it on one manuscript, the one that I looked at with Hoyker Thorgerson in another video, um, whereas my translation will be based on Hoyker's edition, which actually incorporates material from all the manuscripts. Now, in addition to the Eddas, there's the sagas. It's a lot of sagas. And uh, not all of them are translated, or if they are translated, they're not all competently translated. But of the mythical heroic sagas, the most critical is the Saga of the Volsungs, which uh, my translation has been published by Hackett Publishing Company. Uh, I'm still quite happy with that translation. That also includes its medieval fanfic sequel, The Saga of Ragnar Lothbro. And another book of mine from Hackett is uh, Two Sagas of Mythical Heroes, which includes the Saga of Herborn Heidrek, really kind of wild fantasy romp about a, uh, a warrior woman and a cursed sword, and then the Saga of Rolf Kraki, an even more wild fantasy romp uh, about this team of uh, uh, weird mythical heroes and kings. Um, in the sagas of Icelanders, that is to say the more realistic sagas written in Iceland in the 1200s, 1300s about their Viking Age ancestors, um, I recommend that you be familiar with certainly at least the big three. Njal Saga is a good translation by Robert Cook. Uh, the Saga of the People of Laxadal, translated by Kniva Kuhns, and uh, the Saga of Ego Skallagrimsson, translated by Bernard Scudder. Those are I mentioned those because they're the best translations that I'm aware of in English. They're, there might be like a competing translation of one of those that's also okay, but I, I can't think of one. I, I do especially recommend that Cook translation of Njal Saga. Um, the Egil Saga and Lax Dilla Saga translations that I mentioned there are both in a book called The Sagas of Icelanders, published by Penguin. Watch out if you get that book on Kindle. I think that the Kindle version if you go to the Amazon page for the paperback and then click Kindle, I think it may take you to the wrong book, so caveat emptor with that. With other translations, I would just be, uh, you know, I'd be reserved. Uh, check the credentials, or, you know, if that sounds elitist, the competence of the person doing the translation. Um, you know, a lot of sort of free translations are out there on the webs, on the webs. <laughs> What was I saying? Website webs. Um, they're usually public domain. They're often by 19th century amateurs who didn't really actually know the language necessarily all that well and are aiming for a really 
Shakespearean style that's pretty foreign to the original, I think, and, and pretty hard to read today. I'd much rather read the Saga of the Volsungs in Old Norse than in, you know, William Morris's translation. Uh, there's also some even pretty big uh, name publishers that have published translations by surprisingly unqualified people. Um, you know, just because a big publisher published it doesn't mean the big publisher didn't publish it because the big publisher knew it would, you know, sell within their expectations. So, just caveat emptor all around. But when I recommend specific books, I'm recommending them for, for good reasons. Uh, on the subject of culture, the best book that I know to recommend is Judith Jesh's book, Viking Diaspora. That does not sound like uh, it would be some, you know, incredible grounding in the culture of the Viking Age, but it really is. She really gets into the head of this, of the people of this culture, explains very well all the different sort of wrinkles of the society that come up in, in the literature and in archaeology. Spectacularly well-written book. Uh, very, very high recommendation for me. If in the process of uh, reading the Eddas and Sagas you get really interested in, I don't know, sort of the more literary theory stuff, I'm not a great guide to all of that, um, but some of the scholars that I think have most capably written about Norse literature are uh, John McKinnell, Karen Larrington, uh, Judith Jesh again, uh, Johanna Katrin Fritikstosu, Armin Jakobsen. Um, there's a long list of really, really good scholars, uh, both in uh, the Americas and uh, in Scandinavia and in the UK and in Europe and Australia and New Zealand um, and Japan and, I, I, you know, in principle, anywhere. Um, and thanks to academia.edu, which is like a weird old school Facebook for academics, you can find a lot of their articles for free. So I'm going to show you on the screen some names of people that I know are good scholars who do good work. Don't take their appearance here as, you know, them endorsing anything that I might say or vice versa, but you can uh, read any article by these people and be sure that a lot of thought and, um, and knowledge went into it. Uh, not an all-inclusive list by any means, right? Uh, just people that easily come to my mind. And uh, my apologies to anyone who might be, I don't know, inadvertently offended by uh, an omission or, or an inclusion. Uh, on the language, on the meta language front, like the, right, the linguistics front, uh, a lot of people who are interested in Old Norse are interested in the in, in historical linguistics and in philology as well. Uh, very highly recommended book. One of the books that I revisit, reread uh, very frequently is. Um, Fortson's Indo-European Language and Culture. This gives a very good grounding, not only in the aims and means of historical linguistics as a science, but also in the Indo-European language family, the characteristics of the Proto-Indo-European language, uh, and how, how all the different subfamilies are derived from it. There's also, if uh, you have already picked up some good knowledge of Old Norse, or perhaps of another Old Germanic language, like Old English. There's a good book called Old English and Its Closest Relatives that kind of um, teaches you like one sort of Old Germanic language superstructure and helps you to read all of the Germanic languages with uh, that scaffolding of knowledge. So it helps you with reading Old English, Old Norse, Old High German, Gothic, Old Saxon, Old Frisian, um, the important old uh, old Scandinavian languages. For history, uh, again, with history as with uh, literary theory, I'm a little bit outside of my own uh, specialization. I think that Anders Fienrud does a very good job on these subjects in books like The Age of the Vikings, The Conversion of Scandinavia. Um, I feel like there is not a blow-by-blow history of the Viking Age, you know, year by year, um, that's been done recently that I think answers the kind of like, what happened during the Viking Age question, um, you know, from a, a beginning to end chronological viewpoint. Uh, Anders' book, The Viking Age, does a very good job of capturing the 
the sort of sweep of history of the period um, without necessarily having that, that narrow chronological orientation. Uh, I just don't think there's a book quite like that, and probably the closest thing to it was actually written 800 years ago by Snorri Sturluson, um, the author of the Prose Edda, in his book Heimskringla, uh, which is a history of the kings of Norway, beginning with the mythological kings, which are the gods, uh, and leading up to uh, kings of his own day in the 1200s. There is a capable translation by Anthony Fox with the poetry translated by Alison Finlay. This is also available for free at the Viking Society for Northern Research. Um, be aware again, very different translation style than mine. Um, uses pretty old-fashioned English, makes some weird calls about, you know, leaving the word order of the Old Norse as untouched as possible, which certainly gives you an impression of what it's like to read it in Old Norse, but then you could also get that impression from, you know, reading it in Old Norse, and if you were interested in the subject matter, you might you know, want to read it in something more like normal English. At any rate, um, certainly a very capable translation. I just dis disagree with a lot of the translation philosophy, um, and that's at Viking Society for Northern Research. I think it's in three volumes. On the subject of archaeology, uh, this is also something that I think suffers from there may be a book in a Scandinavian language that I'm not aware of that, that that's a solid introduction to this for a non-specialist, but I'm not aware of that book at this time. There are some good archaeologists that uh, I've interviewed on this channel, and I am in the process of better acquainting myself with the field of archaeology uh, with their help, uh, especially uh, Armin uh, Grithlinson uh, in Iceland. Um, so, I don't know, watch the space as I, myself, get more acquainted with archaeology. It's kind of fascinating how much in the academic world people who study uh, languages and texts often are very separated in terms of degree programs and even socialization and conferences from the people who work on artifacts and, uh, and, and you know, the physical world. If you want to know more about manuscripts themselves. This is actually um, another subject where I can't think of a really good introduction in English, although there's a really good introduction in Norwegian in a book called Handbuk i Norun Philologi. Um, however, I do have some videos that can help you kind of get an orientation into this subject. And um, if you become well acquainted with medieval paleography in general, you'll be pretty well served approaching the paleography of the North, especially since uh, Old Norse paleography is uh, initially derivative of English and German paleography. Well, that's a uh, selection of my thoughts on where you can start if you're trying to get a toehold in serious study of this field. I'll wrap up by mentioning that, you know, you can't just look at a book and know right off, <laughs> you know, okay, it's a cliche, right? You can't judge a book by its cover. You can't look at a book and just say, okay, this is definitely by someone who knows what he's talking about. This is, um, you know, definitely going to give me the information that I want. This is definitely, you know, not by someone who horrifically abuses his colleagues and uh, plagiarizes every word supposedly written by him. You know, it's extremely difficult to look at a book and know that. Um, so, just use some common sense in approaching these things, right? If uh, a person whose work you trust recommends someone else's work, then you have kind of a genealogy of reference to get to that person's work, right? Um, you know, competent people tend to recommend other competent people and kind people recommend other kind people and stuff like that. And so if you have some interest in my work, you know, I, I try to recommend people better than I <laughs> right? Um, and, and hopefully none of them will be offended by me recommending them. Yes. Um, but, you know, look at who published it. Self-publishing is a, a kind of an alarm bell. It's not always bad. You know, it's faster, and in this age of, you know, publishing direct to Kindle, it's pretty easy, and some self-published stuff can be okay. Um, but 
I just will always wonder why you didn't want to put your book through a real publisher, right? I mean, and a publisher does so much for you, um, gets your book reviewed by the people who know what they're talking about, which saves you from a lot of trouble down the road. Um, it uh, gets you, you know, nice layout and design, and uh, in my case, helps you meet some uh, people who are just fantastically helpful uh, in, in, in all manner of ways. Um, I would also note that, um, you know, personally, I think that something that's published by an explicitly uh, religious pagan organization uh, about Old Norse stuff might not be super objective about subjects of uh, myth and magic. Oh, I didn't mention magic, but there is a really good academic book about uh, Norse magic, um, magic and witchcraft, witchcraft and magic in the Nordic Middle Ages, something like that. It's the title by uh, Stephen Mitchell. Um, so take that kind of stuff with a grain of salt unless you are, you know, an adherent of the belief system, but then you're doing something more like theology than philology, if that counts as theology, I don't know, but you know what I mean. Like, then you're pursuing a faith-based endeavor rather than scholarship-based endeavor. Uh, and again, I think I mentioned this in a different context, but even big-name publishers, if they decide that they really need to get a book out, um, because you know they want to take advantage of a big fad for something, um, you may publish something that's that's uh, not up to the standards that it, that a, a big name publisher publisher's name would otherwise inspire you to have confidence in. So mostly, what I would say is, like I said, uh, go with people you trust and what those people recommend. And I might not be that person. Maybe you don't like my work. That's that's fine. Um, I have no idea why you're 32 minutes into a video that I made in that case. But, um, you know, I, I still think that regardless of who you like, the principle of follow who you like to other good people is a good one. And there are, of course, books and people I could say negative things about, but I prefer to pass over them in silence. So sometimes my silence is meaningful. Other times it's meaningful as the Colorado wind and uh, from extremely windy heights a beautiful Colorado. For now, I'm going to wish you all the best.